Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Greetings, my name is Jeff Ross. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. Thanks for tuning into this service today. I'd like to begin by reading our scripture passage. It comes from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And it says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is an interesting passage in 1 Timothy as Paul is uh, beginning to talk to Timothy about ministry, and he's given a little bit of his background. He's telling his story. And so I'd like us to look at this story, and I'd like as we read about Paul's story for you to think about your story. Uh, what's your story, especially those of you that have been in the church for a while, uh, or for those of you tuning in new and haven't been in the church for a while, what's your past, what's your background, what's your story, where have you come from, what have you been about? I'd also like you to consider John Newton's story. He wrote the song Amazing Grace. And John Newton had a, a, a pretty extensive past as well and a, an incredible con, uh, uh, transformation in his life uh, to where uh, he wrote this song, Amazing Grace. And so I'd like to, uh, for this morning, kind of overlay those two uh, stories, uh, but also get us to think about our own story and how our story dovetails and fits in with these stories. John Newton writes the words to Amazing Grace, and in the middle of the first line, he says, I once was lost. So he gives a pretty short, descriptive phrase of past life. I once was lost. I, I once was at a place where uh, there was darkness. Paul says in what the scripture we just read, even though I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, uh, Paul gives three descriptive words about that. Sounds pretty lost to me. 
So what about you? What would be the phrase that you would use? Uh, I wonder if when we came to church or uh, uh, church activities, if we had to wear a t-shirt that says, I once was, and then fill in the blank of what our, our struggle was, what our past was, what we overcame, or what Christ is currently doing in our life to help us uh, from this place of lost to this place of found. Newton says, I once was lost. For Newton, that meant that uh, in the 1700s, he was a slave trader. He uh, ran a boat that picked up slaves in Africa, brought them to England. Uh, in the course of that transportation, uh, uh, many of the, the slaves died. Uh, and over time, that began to weigh on Newton. He began to have nightmares. He began to question what he was doing. And he had a radical transformation in his life tried to uh, make up for some of the things that he did. And, and in the course of that conversation, he penned these words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. I wonder what the, our story would be. I once was what? A liar, a thief, a sneak, an adulterer. I once was angry. I once was an alcoholic. I once was on drugs. I once was into pornography. I once was an alcoholic or a workaholic, jealous, envious, selfish. What is it on that list that describes us or what is it that you would put on your list? I once was lost. I, th I think that can describe a lot of us. I once was lost. Maybe there's still some lostness that's taking place, that's, that's going on. Paul says, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man. Newton said simply, I was lost. But the song doesn't end there. He says, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Do you hear the joy in that? Do you hear the hope in that? In our scripture passage, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul says this way, I was shown mercy. The grace of God was poured out on me abundantly. Grace was poured out. That's a, that's a great image, isn't it? That grace is being poured. It's abundant. It's not just a little bit. It's not given out frugally. Newton says, once I was lost, and maybe there was a time that, that you've been lost. Maybe that's a current situation. I've been lost a couple of times uh, or, or more. But there's joy and there's hope to know that that lostness doesn't have to be permanent. That God is in the business of uh, redeeming and forgiving and offering this whole idea of grace. Paul found hope and he found mercy. But I want us to look at the, the descriptive words that he uses to talk about finding this hope and mercy and grace. He says it was poured. Now, he could have used lots of words. He could have used something that was uh, more finite, more uh, contained, uh, where grace, like a Band-Aid, is just put over carefully the spot. Uh, but he doesn't. He uses a different sort of word. He uses the word poured. And the image that we have of something being poured is that it, 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 it continues, it overflows, it, it doesn't matter if some of it gets spilt, it's, it's not protecting itself. So I thought I'd invite us to take a look at it. Watch as this water is poured into this bowl. It gets everywhere, it splashes, it goes over the sides, it, it's not contained in just the bowl. And that's the beauty of this image, that grace is abundant. It's not like God has this finite little uh, uh, vial of grace that, that'll run out if he's not careful. Uh, grace isn't like that. It, it doesn't run out. It, it's, it's not contained. Uh, there's no worry on God's part that he's going to run out of grace and sharing it. Grace is something that is... 
uh, as it's poured, uh, it maybe splashes a little bit. Maybe it gets on uh, somebody else. Poured is not careful. It's not meager. It's not scrimping. It's not stingy. It's not thrifty. It's not unwasteful. Poured is messy, it's generous, it's lavish, it's uneconomical, it's exaggerated, it's exuberant, plentiful, and unrestrained. And that's what God says grace is like, uh, that God offers this kind of grace that uh, uh, is, is more than enough. There's more than enough for you, there's more than enough for me. It's poured, and it's liable to get on something it maybe wasn't intended for, and that's okay, too. Paul says, I had grace, love, and faith poured all over me. I was soaked to the bone with it. John Newton simply says, I was lost, but now I'm found. And there's joy, and there's hope. And there's something to celebrate in that for all of us. But it seems like in the song, Newton was worried about not being clear. And so he doesn't just use the, I was lost, now I'm found metaphor. Uh, He uses a different one. He follows, I was lost, but now I'm found with, I was blind. I was blind. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, I was the worst sinner. Wow. I was blind. I was the worst sinner. I love Newton's image of being blind. I I wear glasses, contacts now. I have an astigmatism. And uh, sometimes when I look out without my glasses, things get a little blurry. Things get a little distorted. Things um, are different as my brain is processing them than what they really are. Especially words and phrases, I could confuse something that I thought said this, but really uh, says that. And and so it's the image I like that Newton says, I was blind, but now I see. Sometimes we don't really see the whole picture, we just see part of the picture. We see a part of the picture that our culture, our friends, our family, uh, the people we've lived life with, uh, the part of the country or world that we've grown up in, uh, we see the world from that image and we don't see it from other places and so we're blind in a sense to some of the realities that are around us. We distort images, people, events uh, to fit the, the sight that we have Uh, And sometimes that's not helpful. Sometimes as we see that that distortion leads to war, racism, human trafficking, a host of struggles and battles uh, where people have taken an idea and misinterpreted uh, what they deserve or want or need out of it. Paul says he was the worst of sinners. I I don't want to get into a contest right now of who's the worst sinner. Uh, We all have sinned, uh, and that's the reality of Scripture. Romans 3.23 says, we have all sinned and fallen short of the mark. So it doesn't matter the extent of our sin. The reality is that we're all in the same condition. We all suffer from the same malady. So go ahead, take a look around the room that maybe you're watching this with today. Are there other folks there? Take a look around. One thing that's true is that we're all sinners. None of us are exempt from that. We all have that one thing in common. We all sin. We're blind. We have been blind. We'll probably continue to be blind in in areas of our life as long as we live. Paul says, I was the worst sinner. Maybe he was. John Newton simply says, I was blind. The song continues, though, with another word of hope. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see again. It's a, it's a phrase of hope. It's an image of hope that What we were lost to could be found. What we were blind to 
can be turned to sight, but now I see. <laughs> Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, verse 16, I was shown mercy. Mercy is an interesting idea, an interesting concept. Mercy, mercy is getting what... Mercy is not getting what we deserve. And grace is getting what we don't deserve. I've been in the church a long time, and, and I struggle with this idea of um, trying to help people see and understand uh, and, and this finite amount of grace that, that some people think the world has. I just don't get how we were lost and now found, uh, how we were blind and now see that we don't celebrate that more. Uh, it seems like over the years that we take that idea, that grace, that gift of God, and we turn it into rules and laws and, and we exclude. We, we seem to champion the idea of finding who we can exclude from that list of grace. But I don't see that in the scripture at all. I don't see that the grace is intended to be uh, excluded uh, or keep people from it. It's an offer to everyone. How can something so amazing as the grace of God uh, be turned into something that uh, we, we try to protect from other folks as if God needs us to protect? And, and so this, this idea I struggled with for a long time, and it really hit home to me uh, uh, a couple of years ago in my backyard. I live in Dahlonega. We live on kind of a side of a hill, and there's some wooded areas nearby. And so we noticed that some deer from time to time uh, would pass through our yard. So my wife, Sherry, decided she'd start trying to feed the deer. She bought some corn, she put it out in a little dish, and lo and behold, the, the deer began to come by. She would put the, the corn out at a certain time of day, and uh, kind of like clockwork, the deer began to come and, uh, and eat the corn. They seemed pretty appreciative. They didn't wave or nod their head or, or clap their uh, paws or hooves, uh, but they, uh, they did seem to enjoy the corn. And so uh, we noticed that over time they had some other uh, family members, I guess, that would come and join them uh, with the, the corn, and they all seemed to get along and enjoy it and, and have a good time. Uh, part of my ignorance was I thought all the deer that are out there were all part of the same family, got along, hey, we're deer, so we'll work together. But uh, evidently, that's not true. Uh, we found and discovered that the deer are sort of territorial in their family pockets of deer that may or may not get along with other family pockets pockets of deer. And so one afternoon we're sitting out on the, on the deck watching the deer and uh, uh, eat the corn and we're looking at ones that we've named and knew and were familiar and all of a sudden four or five other deer come that we hadn't, didn't recognize uh, and they slowly approach the plate with the corn on uh, and when they did the deer that we'd become familiar with uh, began to get pretty riled up. They snorted, they, they lifted up their paws and started smacking the deers that were new, uh, and we were, we were astonished. Uh, they were protecting the corn as if it was their corn. They were protecting the corn uh, as if they'd gone to the store and bought it and had prepared it that evening for their family and somebody was stealing a meal that they had bought and paid for. And so we were aghast. I started screaming, hey, it's not your corn. <laughs> um, it's Kind of funny to be screaming at the deer, but it, it, it was not their corn. Sherry and I had put the corn out, and we didn't put any restrictions on who could get it. We wanted all the deer to enjoy the corn, but the original set of deer had decided it was their corn, and they were going to keep it from those new deer that didn't belong to their group. 
And I thought, oh my gosh, what, what a great image, what a great metaphor for how the church seems to work too often where we decide this little group is better or different or more enlightened than other folks and so we deserve God's grace but those folks don't and they don't until they conform to our idea of what it's like to experience the grace of God uh, who deserves it. Going back to the the image of pouring, grace is abundant. It overflows. It's not a bottomless pit. Um, I mean, it's not limited. It it is a bottomless pit. Uh, God's grace is abundant. God's not going to run out of grace. We don't have to protect grace, and we don't have to protect God. Paul says he received mercy, and that's noteworthy because he, com- he, he, uh, he, he claims to be the chief sinner. John Newton did some horrible things, but he still received this grace. He once was lost, but was found, was blind, but he sees, and he, he writes about amazing grace. Even for John Newton, if God's grace can be poured out on Paul and on John Newton, and certainly God's grace can be poured out on you and me. Certainly, we're worthy. As this service is is being taped, we're preparing uh, for the first Sunday in October, World Communion Sunday. And World Communion Sunday is is noteworthy in that uh, people from all over the world, all backgrounds, all nationalities, all cultures, all races, all colors, all groups, all persuasions, come together to celebrate the grace of God that is poured out on them just as much as it's poured out on you and me. We celebrate that it's God's grace, that it's not ours. (laughs) We We don't get to decide who gets it. And who doesn't? We simply get to receive it and humbly celebrate God's grace. Let us pray. God, we celebrate that mercy is getting what mercy is not getting what we deserve, and that grace is getting what we don't deserve. And there's so much that we don't deserve but your grace is amazing, over the top, uh, poured out, as Paul says. We give you thanks, God, that uh, we've received it, that we can receive it even this day. I pray for folks this morning that, or, or this day that are hearing this and feeling like, gosh, that, that's a great story, but that grace isn't for me. I've, I've, what I've done, who I am, what I've, I've uh, said and done, it, uh, grace just isn't for me. God, I help you. I I, I pray that you will speak into our heart, that your Holy Spirit will reveal that that, that's just not true, that grace is for everyone, that it's poured out, even for folks like Paul, even for folks like John Newton, even for folks like you and me. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that He made us in His image, and what the Bible tells us is that His image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create 
humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.